book of Exodus. We'll pick back up with our survey of the books of the Bible. Not going in a lot of detail on this stuff, but you know, uh, it's important, you know, it's important, folks, that we don't, you don't take right division to the point that you rid yourself of all Bible study. You know, Paul said in Romans 15 that what was written aforetime was written for our learning and for our admonition. Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that what had happened to the Jews in the wilderness was for our example, didn't he? That we may learn in them not to lust after evil things. You know, and so... There's a, if, if, as you read Paul's epistles, you'll find out real quick that he makes application from the Old Testament constantly. And uh, one of the places is actually, if you look there, look there in Exodus chapter uh, 16. Exodus 16. Something I've, I've learned about myself. And I, I believe it's it really it's it's just re, it's just mankind in general. Denominational Christianity and Christianity in general is just a bunch of extremes. Uh, Calvinism is an extreme. Armenianism is an extreme. Uh, and what you end up with, man's just man's got this tendency to go to extremes. He 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 ends up in one one ditch or another. And you take, men take a good thing like right division and studying to show thyself approved unto God and they make an, take, it, take it to an extreme. But look there in Exodus 16, verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents and the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it, meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Now what he's talking about here is, is the manna. Now they went out every morning to gather it, and when they went out, the, everybody gathered, and then some men would gather more and some would gather less, but then they'd measure it out. And when they was done, nobody had more than they were supposed to have and nobody had need. Now, do you know Paul quotes that in the New Testament? He quotes that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 about giving money. And that's, that's making application of Scripture. And Paul, what Paul's point is there in Corinthians is that an abundant church should not be hoarding to itself but that, that they should be supplying the needs of those who are in want. And then when that church is in abundance, they can turn around and supply to another church that's in need. And what he says is, he says, he that gathered, Paul says, as it is written, he that gathered much had nothing left over. And they that gathered little had nothing, had nothing, had no lack. And you know, I've, I've seen that principle. Now, listen, as, 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 Members of the body of Christ and being under grace and not under the law, we're not under Israel's tithe. God never told Israel to tithe money anyway. The tithe of Israel was usually first fruits of the land, firstborn of the animals and things of that nature. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians that the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. I believe people under grace ought to give more than people under the law. Amen. I believe, I believe those of us who have been saved by the greatest gift that's ever been given, and that is the Son of God dying for us on the cross, we as people in the body of Christ, under God's grace, should be the greatest givers in the world. Amen? And I, I've seen this principle, though, where Paul, what Paul's talking about, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, about uh, cheerfully giving, that God is able to make sure that you have all grace, all sufficiency, that you can abound in every good work. God will take care of, of the giving. God will take care of the need. We got this guy over in India, and I'll show you this principle. I was showing Corin on my phone this morning. I got this guy in India that I send money to once a month. Every time, Gary, I send that guy money, I get it back. 
within, within what, corn a day, 20 minutes sometimes? You know, it's, it's, it's like that. Cindy made $100 the other day. The next day, a, a lady, I, I won't mention her name because this stuff goes out on YouTube. She knows who she is. The very next day after sending that guy $800, got $800 back. That's how God does. Amen? And that's a principle. Paul quotes that principle from the story of the Jews gathering man in the wilderness. And so there's application in Scripture, folks. Now, the book of Exodus, we've seen, it covers a period. I believe it's a period of roughly about 145 years. In Exodus 1.6... The death of Joseph is right there in Exodus 1-6. That happens around, I'll do it in B.C. so that y'all can understand it a little bit better. That happens around, Joseph dies around 1635 B.C. That's the death of Joseph. Joseph dies. Moses is born in 2-2, Exodus 2-2. Moses is born there in 1571 B.C. Moses is born. Now, how, how long, you know, I'm going to get, I'm just a trick question now. How long was Israel in Egypt? Huh? How many did you say? 40? How many did you say? How many did you say? 400? How many did you say, Stephen? They are all wrong. But, <laughs> I mean, we're, but I mean, they are all wrong. We're, I mean, we're going to see this this morning. Because this is the re only reason I ask you that, because this, this is what some people call a major contradiction in the Bible. When they compare Exodus 12 and Galatians 3 with, with Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 15 and Acts chapter 7, they think there's a contradiction in the Bible. We're going to answer that this morning. But Exodus 2.2, 2, Moses is born in 1571 B.C. He flees to Midian in 1531 B.C. That's when he leaves Egypt and flees down into Midian. And then around, he returns to Egypt 40 years later in 1491 B.C. He returns to Egypt and then the Exodus happens that year, one year or no, the Exodus happens that year. The last event recorded in the book of Exodus is 1490 B.C. And that's, the, that's when they set up the tabernacle in the wilderness. And so what you have to understand, we looked at this the other day. From Exodus, well, I think it's Exodus chapter 4, when he returns back into Egypt, all the way to the end of the book is a one-year period. Amen. And so, and so the narrative slows down a lot in Egypt. And when God slows down time in that Bible, it's because he's given you important details. Amen? If you notice there, there in the book of Genesis, as you go from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years of history right there in about 11 chapters, then you get to Abraham and the narrative slows down because the narrative got important. When you get over here, God covers one year of details in about 36 chapters. Now, <clears throat> the book of Exodus records the birth of a nation. That's what it's about. They went down into Israel as a family. If you look there in Exodus 1-5, they entered Egypt as a family of 70 souls. It says, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. They went down to 70 souls, and they came out a great nation. The first chapter of Exodus records how, how this nation was fruitful and increased abundantly and waxed mighty. But God told Jacob in Genesis 46 and 3 to not be afraid to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And that the book of Exodus records the birth of a nation. Now the book records three things. And then we're going, we're going to look at some dates. And it's going to be boring. But we're going to answer a contradiction this morning. I've picked up commentary after commentary. I've seen men run to Hebrew and Greek and try to explain things away. And if you just read the text of the Bible, the Bible there's no contradictions in the Bible. 
And we either believe our English text is perfect or we don't. And a lot of the times men just don't want to study or, or put forth the effort. But the book records basically three things. It records Israel's bondage. It records their redemption and their deliverance from, by God. And then it records their covenant beginning in chapter 19. Some of, the, some of the most ignorant words spoken in that Bible was all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Amen. That was some of the most ignorant words ever spoken by mankind. If I'd have been Israel, I'd have been like, I kind of like the program we've been under since we left Egypt. Where you just, <laughs> you're just good to us and we don't have any requirements. <laughs> but but, but it, it, anyway, they make a covenant with God and it's a conditional covenant. Now, this is important because God, before any of this, made a bunch of promises to a man that were unconditional. And there's a period there between the promises and the giving of the law. And Paul points this out in Galatians chapter 3 and says that the covenant of the law, which came 430 years later, could not do away with the promises made to Abraham. Amen. And so it's important to get, you know what Paul's doing there? He's rightly dividing the word of truth, man. That's what he's doing, showing the differences between the promise, promises and the covenant, but, or the promises and the covenant of the law. Now look in, look in Exodus chapter 12. Let's get started on this. Exodus 12, 40. Their deliverance, their redemption and their deliverance. Now the sojourning, Exodus 12, 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was what? 430 years. Now y'all was like, say, we were right. It didn't say they dwelt in Egypt the whole time. It just said they, the, children, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt. It didn't say that they dwelt in Egypt for the whole 430 years. Because if you study the time, which I have, I've got all the dates in my Bible. When you come back... And I'll draw this stuff, write this stuff up here so you can keep up with it because it can get a little bit confusing. But the Bible says in Genesis 47 and 9 that Jacob was 130 years old when he went into Egypt. All right? Now you go backwards. Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? He was 100. 25 years passed by between Abraham going into Canaan and Isaac being born, then 65 years, 60 years pass by, Jacob's born, and then 130 years later, Jacob goes down into Egypt. All right? Joseph dies down there. But basically what you do, if you, if you trace all this out, Jacob was born in the year 1831 B.C., back here somewhere. 1831 B.C., Jacob was born, and he goes down into Egypt in 1701 B.C. Now, when was the Exodus? 1491. Does that look like 400 years to you? No. How many years was between the promises and the giving of the law? Paul tells you in Galatians. Come on, man. We read our Bibles at home. <laughs> Turn to Galatians 3, check me out. Galatians 3. Like Ruckman used to say, don't get me foaming at the mouth, man. <laughs> look, at, look at Galatians 3. Now, was the giving of the law and the exodus in the same year? Let me ask you that. Do we know that? Did Israel leave Egypt and get the law in the same year? It was actually about 50 days later. They got the law on Pentecost. Okay, so it was just about a month, about 50 days apart there. Now, how long did Paul say was between the promises and the giving of the law? Galatians 3, what is it, verse 17, verse 16? The law, which was what? 430, how many, how many years? 430 years. When were the promises made to Abraham? They began in Genesis 12. So between Genesis 12 and the Exodus, 430 years. So they didn't dwell in Egypt for 430 years. They were only in Egypt for 210 years. If you study that thing out. So, so from, the, from Jacob going down into Egypt, 
till the exodus up here, they were down there for 210 years. Now, here's, here's where it's going to get a little more tricky. It's where the people think the contradiction comes in. Look in, look in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. Verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them how long? <laughs> 400 years. Now, that, but believe it or not, people say it's a contradiction. Exodus 12, 40 said, Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 40 said 430 years. But God told Abraham that they would, they would be a stranger for 400 years. Stephen quotes that in Acts chapter 7 and says 400 years. Paul quotes 430 years in Galatians chapter 3. And there's men that can't figure it out. But it's not hard if you read the text. When does the sojourning of Israel begin? Look in Hebrews chapter 11. You know the biggest problem with men today, and I'll be honest with you, the biggest problem with men today is their brain. They, I, honest to goodness, I mean that. The biggest problem with men today is they think the Bible is it's up to their intellect to understand the Bible. The Bible is the, is the greatest. This Listen, when I hold this thing in my hand, I believe this is the most perfect thing in heaven and earth. I don't, believe, I don't believe there's anything wrong with this book, Gary. I don't believe you can improve it. I believe it just has to simply be read and studied. Now, when did the sojourning of Israel begin? The problem is people going through the Bible trying to figure out the Bible and ain't never read the Bible. I mean, look, look, look at the information we're getting this morning. We've been to Exodus, Genesis, Acts, Galatians, and now we're in the book of Hebrews. What chance do you stand if you don't read the entire Bible? Look at Hebrews 11 and 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, which he should what? After receive for an inheritance. You know, Abraham never got that. So when God promised him that he would be heir of the world, you know what he's promising Abraham? He's promising him a resurrection one day. Abraham obeyed this. God never told him he was going to give him that land. He said he was going to give it to his seed. He told Abraham, I'm going to show you the land in his, in his, in his earthly life. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he what? Sojourned. Right? So when did the sojourning begin? When Abraham left his father's house to go into a land that God was going to show him. He sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him, the heirs with him of the same promise. All right, so come to the book of Genesis now. Genesis chapter 12. When did, Abra when did the sojourning of Israel begin? And this is why Paul numbers the 430 years to the promises. Hope you're keeping up with this, man. I know it's confusing. Let me draw a different timeline up here. When, it said, when, when Moses says that the sojourning of Israel was the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. He's numbering their sojourning back to Genesis 12 when Abraham, when Abraham leaves Ur of the Chaldees. He actually leaves Haran. He left, he left, Ur, of the, he left Ur of the Chaldees and in Genesis 12, 1 it says, because they had dwelt in Haran for about five years. And I ain't going to go into the math of how I got that five years, but just look at Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto who? Abram. Had said. At some point in the past. 
So they left Ur the Chaldees, they come to Haran, and they dwelt there until, until Terah died, Abraham's father. But this is, this is where the promises begin. Look at what he says. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. Is that a promise? And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless. Who's making the promises? What's the condition God puts upon it for Abraham? He said, get out of your father's house, come to this land, I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to do these things. These are the promises that Paul's talking about in Galatians, which he says the law, which was 430 years later, could not disannul. Right? So when does Israel sojourning and the 430 years begin? It begins in Genesis chapter 12. You follow that now? All right, now that happened, if you, do the, if you do the history of it, and do the dates, and I ain't going to bore you with all that this morning, but these promises, Abraham receives these promises and, and leaves Ur the Chaldees in 921 B.C. Now he lives in, in Haran for about five years, and in 1916, five years later, 1916 B.C., he leaves Haran to go into the land of Canaan, and he's 75 years old when that happens. Abraham's 75 years old. Now, why is that important? Because when's Isaac born? He's born when he's 100. Paul tells you that. Genesis tells you that. So Isaac's born what? 25 years later. You say, why is this important? Well, come to Genesis 15, 13. I'll show you why it's important. This, is, this, this answers the contradiction. Know of a surety that who? Thy seed. Not Abraham. Who's the seed? Genesis 21 and 12. And Isaac shall thy seed be called. Right? So when does the 400 years begin? It begins with the birth of Isaac, who was born. Now, the promises were that the, 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 the 430 years began in 1921 BC. Isaac is born, and I can show you all this in the scripture. Isaac is born 30 years later on the date of 18, I've got it wrote down here, 1891. 1891 BC, Isaac's born. Isaac is born right there. Sixty years later, Jacob is born in, I've got these dates written down, folks. I've lost my place in my notes. But Jacob's born up here 60 years later. That'd be 1831, 1831 B.C. And then 130 years later in 1701, he goes down into Egypt. And then 220 years later, I believe it is in 14, 210 years later, 1491, the Exodus. Now you go back 430 years, you come to that date. You go back 400 years, you come to this date. There's not a contradiction in the Bible. And I hope you kept up with that. And you may, not, you may be sitting here thinking, I, I, don't, I, don't get, I don't get what the point is. The point is, is every commentary you pick up in America claims that's a contradiction in the King James Bible. That's the problem. You got, you got a bunch of men running churches today who think they're smarter than God and smarter than the book. And men who are humble to the book will find the answers. Amen? Now, the four major things I want to highlight in the book of Exodus. Come to Exodus chapter, or Psalm, I'm sorry, Psalm 78. We're going to get into some nuggets here. I wanted to lay this out to get the dates right. Psalm 78. The four major things that I'm going to point out in the book of Exodus, we ain't going to get to them this morning, but I'm going to point out the plagues. We're going to talk about them a little bit. The Passover, 
I want to highlight the Passover and the details of the Passover. The covenant. The covenant. Now, folks, I'm sorry, man. Is the law good? Is the law holy? Is there anything wrong with reading it? No. Paul said we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing that the law was not made for, for, for a righteous man, but for the, for, the, for the godless and disobedient. I mean, you, you realize what an understanding of righteousness you receive by reading God's law? Understanding equality and righteousness and those things? It's the most righteous law that's ever been penned. And people act like it's a horrible thing. Go back there and read it. Now, I'm not saying you're under it. And I'm not saying you have to keep it. But, I mean, it should be our goal as we come. What is the goal of the spiritual life God has given us in Christ? Y'all know what the goal of it is? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Do you know that? You know what the fulfillment of that law is? Love. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Once you know the love of Christ, you know what you're going to do? You're going to love God the way you should love God and you're going to love each other the way you should love each other. Now, all that aside, we're not talking about the, the Levitical law and all that stuff that's been done away. But the sentence, be, I mean, there's people out there It's like, well, I'm not under the law so I can murder. Oh, knock it off, man. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And so we're going to look at the covenant, and then we're going to, we're going to look at, in great detail at the tabernacle. You know, that's the thing we're going to look at the most. But look here in Psalm 78. This is all I'm going to say about the plagues. Psalm 78, 42. You know why God did things the way he did things in Exodus? You know why he hardened Pharaoh's heart? I mean, people have a problem with that. I've heard people have a problem with it. Pharaoh's going to let him go and God hardened his heart. You're dealing with a nation of people that enslaved another people, threw their babies in the river. How long did God put up with it before he finally did something? Amen? And when it comes time for God to judge, he's like, you're not going to get off the hook that easy. Now I'm going to show my power in you. The first thing Pharaoh said to, to the word of God was, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Moses come down there and told God, Pharaoh says, Pharaoh says, who's the Lord that I should obey him? He says, he says the Hebrew children are, you know, they've got it too easy and now they talk about being let go. He said, now they're going to make brick without and we're not going to give them straw. You're going to put out the same and he makes the bondage worse. Moses comes to the Lord and says, what's going on, God? I thought you, you said you was going to come down here and let the people go. He says, now wilt thou see what I do unto Pharaoh. That's what he tells him. I mean, God, every time Pharaoh said, I've sinned against the Lord, God, God hardened his heart. He said, I'm not done yet. I ain't shown everything I want to show. Look at Psalm 78 and 42. This is a recount of, of, of those plagues. Now, this is Israel. It said, they remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. That is the most baffling story I've ever read is the book of Exodus. The things them Jews saw, Gary. The things that they saw God do just in Egypt. They, was, they saw the hail and the thunder come down and kill all the cattle of Egypt and not touch theirs. They seen that stuff. They seen, the, they seen darkness all over the land of Egypt, but, but they had light in their part. They saw the death of the firstborn and how God spared their... They watched God drown Pharaoh and his armies in the sea. And in the next chapters, they're saying, did you bring us down here to kill us with hunger? Did you come down here to thirst us to death? It baffles me when I read that story. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. And had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them which devoured them. Frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. 
He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. You know, over there, over there in chapter, I believe it's the eighth plague, when God's warning them, it's after the locusts come down in there, Moses, or Pharaoh's own servants and the people of Egypt come to him and say, let this people go. Do you, do you not know all of Egypt is destroyed? What a stubborn man. Then he'd soften up a little bit and God hardened him. <laughs> you know. But look, look at what he says. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death but gave their life over to the pestilence and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham. Let me tell you something. COVID is, is not even, it don't even belong to be mentioned in the same breath of the things that's going to happen in the 70th week of Daniel. This same God's still on the throne of heaven. Amen. This same God for 2,000 years has been long suffering with mankind. But Paul said to you, despise his goodness and forbearance, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy impenitent heart, hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What's going on in Egypt, here is a foretaste of what God is going to do in all the earth one day. Did he turn their waters to blood? Is he going to do it in Revelation? Did he send darkness over, over all the land of Egypt? Is he going to do it in Revelation? You talk about killing the firstborn. That Bible says there was not a house in Egypt where one was not dead. You realize there's two plagues in the book of Revelation that takes out, one of them takes out 25% of the earth's population and another one takes out one third. Like that. Seven years, Gary. We got a population right now of seven, about seven and a half to eight billion people. Those two plagues alone are going to take out about three and a half to four billion of them. You know what God's doing here? Why he did this in Egypt? Look in verse 52. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them on safely so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. God is revealing two things about himself there in Egypt. He's revealing, number one, his wrath and his mercy. Amen? God got him fame. Look, look back in Exodus. I'm going to show you this. Come back to the book of Exodus. Chapter, let me find it, chapter 9. Now, Calvinists don't know how to handle verses like this. Exodus 9, 14. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people. You know what's in? By the time you get to this plague, you know what the other plagues have been? They've been a foretaste. They've been just, they've been just little nuisances, really. Lice. You know, blood in the water, and they had to go out and dig for water. God hasn't killed anything yet. Amen? But now when he gets to the eighth plague, he said, now it's, it's getting real. And all they of Egypt had every opportunity. Because it says about this plague that those who regarded God's word gathered their cattle in from the field, and those who didn't regard left them out, and their cattle was killed, and any man that was in the field died. How could you not have regarded what God said by this point? Moses goes down there and says, let my people go. And he turns, he turns all the dust. He holds that rod up, smites the dust of Egypt. And all the lice in the land becomes lice. I mean, what else, what else could have been done? They had every opportunity here, but here's, here's God telling him now. He said, for I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people 
that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. That's scary words. If I'd have been, man, if that had been me, Corn, I'd have been on my face. I'd have been on my face in the fear of God. Verse 16, he says, And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up. You know why Pharaoh's got the power he's got? He only got that power because God gave him that power for the sole purpose of bringing him down one day. He's going to do the same thing to the man of sin. There is no counsel against God, folks. The powers that be are ordained of God. And he sets, he sets the Antichrist up on that throne and allows him to have that power for the sole purpose of his son coming and smiting him down one day. Amen. So that the nations, because you know what they say about him in Revelation 13? Who is able to make war with the beast? They'll find out in about 42 months. When the King of kings and the Lord of lords comes and smites him down into the dust and throws him out into a lake of fire for all eternity then the whole earth is going to know there's none like him, Gary. Pharaoh, God raised up Pharaoh, for, he says, for the same purpose have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. They're still talking about it today. Events that happened in 1491 B.C. We're sitting here in the year 2020, Still talking about them on Sunday morning. You think it didn't work? About 40 years later, they're going down into, into the land of Canaan. You know what Rahab the harlot said? said, our heart, he, said he said, we faint, our hearts melted because we've heard of all the things that your God did to the gods of Egypt. 400 and some years later, they're down there fighting the Philistines. Right, And the Philistines whip up on the Israelites and the Israelites get this big idea, we'll bring the Ark of God into the camp. And when the Ark of the Covenant comes up into the camp, they start shouting for joy and the Philistines hear that shout and they say, what meaneth this shout? And they said, the Ark of God is coming to the camp and they all trembled. The Philistines trembled and said, this is the great gods who smote the Egyptians with all the plagues. 400 years later, they're still talking about it, Gary. Mm -hmm. Egypt was the premier civilization of that time. And God brought it to ruins in a period like that. Didn't even take him a year. Destroyed their crop. Destroyed their livestock. Destroyed their water. Destroyed their health. And then ultimately took all the heirs and the firstborn of Egypt right out from under them. Amen. I'm thankful to be in the body of Christ, and I know we're apart from politics and all this other stuff, but I'm telling you the ungodly will bring an end and ruin to any nation. All it takes is one stubborn king, Gary, who will not hearken unto the word of God, and they'll bring your nation to nothing. Amen, amen, amen. They're still talking about this great fame and power of God, but they ain't seen nothing yet. What happened in Egypt was just a taste of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amen? The day of the Lord's coming. I believe we're getting very close to the day of the Lord. And I tell you, man, over there, over there where the psalmist said, this is the day that the Lord hath made, Man, that day, that day's a day God's been talking about for thousands of years. Every prophet wrote about the day of the Lord. That's the one single day God's been writing about and warning men about now for thousands of years. Peter writes about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But the book of the, these 10 plagues is just a foretaste of that great Terrible day of the Lord. Look in Exodus chapter 12 now. 
A little bit about the Passover, and then we'll pick up with the covenant. The, the law, the covenant of the law, and the... I'm going to spend some time on that next week, and then we're going to look at the tabernacle. And this morning, I'm going to close with the Passover. The Passover in Exodus chapter 12. So many details of the crucifixion are laid out in this text. How does a, how does a man... You know, did, you, you realize Moses didn't have a Bible, don't you? Y'all realize that, right? <laughs> Moses had no scriptures. He's writing about some feast, some memorial feast that God told him to write down. There's no way Moses could have got this many details correct about a man who's going to die some 1,500 years later on a cross in Jerusalem. Moses pins things about this Passover that he couldn't have possibly known. No water, roast with fire. You know what that means? God says, he says, when you kill my Passover, he said, you don't roast it. He said, don't you sod it at all with water. You roast it with fire. How did Moses know Christ was going to say, I thirst on that cross? How did, how did, how did Moses know Psalm 22 about the, about about the melting inside of him and his tongue and all this stuff. You know what that's saying? God says, you withhold mercy for my Passover. No water, roast it with fire. You realize why God did that? I don't think many of us really truly appreciate what Christ is enduring on that cross. God spared not his own son, Gary. He spared him not. He said, I thirst, and they gave him vinegar. Yeah. Amen. But these details of, of, the, of the crucifixion right here. Look there in verse number three. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Now, you realize how many lambs that is? I mean, we know there was at least 600,000 Jews there. Every man a lamb for his house. You know how many times God calls this lamb it in the text? He never says lambs. He never speaks of it as plural. You got thousands and thousands of lambs being, being killed here, but God always refers to the lamb as singular. Why do you think that is? It's foreshadowing something. But not only that, how did Moses know the very day Christ was going to publicly enter into Jerusalem? You realize that? The lamb was to be taken on the 10th day of the month and kept up and then on the 14th day of the month the whole congregation of Israel was to put that lamb to death. Amen. You know what that Bible says? In the book of Matthew if you study Matthew 21 clear out the chapter 26 you know what you're going to find out? Christ entered Jerusalem on one day he goes into the temple. He drives out the money changers. Said, my house should be called a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. And he goes back to Bethany and spends the night there in the Mount of Olives. The second day he comes in there and he spends from Matthew, from Matthew 20, halfway through Matthew 21, clear up into chapter 25 is one day. He's in that temple the whole day teaching until he leaves the temple and goes up on the Mount of Olives and gives his disciples Matthew 24, Matthew 25. But two days there, right? On the, then it says in Matthew 26, he tells his disciples, you know that after two days is Passover. Right? You know what that means? 10th, 11th, Passover's on the 14th, 12th, 13th. What day did he enter Jerusalem? The 10th day of that month. What day did they kill him? The 14th. How did Moses know that, Corn? God knew it. 
He's laying out the details of the sacrifice of his son here and telling that Jew to always be in remembrance of it so that they wouldn't be ignorant when these things happened. That Jew should have been looking for this, Gary. Should have been looking for it. You know what they did? He said, you take, he said, you take that lamb on the 10th day. And then he starts giving some details about this lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. <laughs> Read those chapters again right there. Read Matthew 21. They spend two days, Gary, trying to find a fall in this man. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, they all come in the temple trying to trip him up. And he's got, a, he's got an answer for them every time. By what authority do you do this? He said, by, by, he said, by what authority did John baptize? They said, well, if we, if we say by God, he'll say, why don't you believe him? If we say that, that he, did, he didn't have the authority, they'll say, well, you, you know, the people regard him as a prophet. He's like, we can't answer. He said, neither can I answer you. You know, Pharisees try to, the Sadducees try to get him tripped up on the resurrection. He said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. They couldn't get nowhere with the man. And finally, he looks at them and said, I got a question for you. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. He said, then why does David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And it said they answered him not a word, neither durst they ask him anything from that point on. And then he rips them up on one end and down the other in Matthew 23, calls them whited sepulchers, hypocrites, and everything else. That's not all. Before that 14th day comes, Caiaphas, Judas, you know what Judas said about him? I've betrayed innocent blood. You know what Pilate's wife said about him? I've suffered many things in a dream this night of that man. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. You know what Pilate said about him? I find no fault in him. You know what Herod said about him? I find no fault in him. For four days they examined that man and found him to be without blemish. Amen? <laughs> Moses got some details here, don't he? <laughs> this is what he says. You shall keep it up unto the 14th day of the same month. And the what? The whole assembly. You ever wonder, you ever think about how, how, how long ago God was setting all this up? You know, he's going to tell that Jew that they have to all come to Jerusalem on this day. That's going to be one of his commandments. Mm -hmm. that, that on the Passover, all the males of Israel have to come and appear before him in Jerusalem. How did Moses, how did Moses know that the whole assembly of the congregation was going to be gathered that day on Passover to crucify the Lamb of God? Right. What do you do with a book like this? Some people, these Jews read this thing, man, and they, st the veil is still over the, over the reading of the Old Testament. They can't see it. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it when? In the evening. <laughs> the details are there, man. The 14th day, the whole congregation. Notice what he says, or notice that word. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill what? It, singular. You see that? There's thousands of lambs being killed on Passover, but God calls it it, and he says they shall kill it in the evening. You realize he even nails down the time of the day Christ is going to die? You realize, you realize that the whole congregation of Israel that day gathered when Pilate was determined to let the man go? Pilate took him and scourged him, Gary. I mean, that's why Christ got such a bad day that day. Pilate scourged him, hoping to appease the people. And he brought him back out there, man, a bloody pulp. Them Roman soldiers were brutal, man. Christ said in one back there in Psalm 22, he said, I may tell all my bones they stare upon me. 
That means he could look down and see his bones coming out of his, or, or, or he, the flesh had been ripped off his bones. He could see his bones. And he says there, that Pilate brings him out there, man, and he says, he says, behold the man. And then they said, crucify him. He said, why, what has he done? He said, you take him and crucify him. They said, we have a law. And by our law, he should die because he made himself to be the son of God. Yeah. Ruckman was the first man I heard mention this part of that story. Pilate pulls him back in the judgment hall and said, whence comest thou? He said he knew he was from Galilee. He had already sent him back to Herod. Pilate knew where he was from. When they said he makes himself to be the son of God, Pilate got scared. He had never seen a man like this, Gary. You can't be standing face to face with the Son of God and not realize there's something different about him. So when they said he made himself to be the Son of God, Pilate pulls him back in there and says, where did you come from? Christ said, my kingdom's not of this world. Amen. <laughs> Boy, I'd have been knocking at my knees, Corey. My knees would have been knocking. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, my soldiers would have fought. But henceforth is my kingdom not of this world. And then he, he, Pilate takes him back out there and he asks him again and they say, crucify him. And I believe Pilate this time, I believe he knows Christ is their king. He said, shall I crucify your king? They said, we have no king but Caesar. Pilate washed his hands and they said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Amen. Amen. That's what they said. Pilate said, see to it. You know what Pilate put over that man's cross? Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. They said, no, no, no. Put that he said, he, he said, what I've written, I've written. You think Pilate didn't know who he was? Yeah. I believe Pilate knew who he was. Amen. <laughs> what details in this story? I've got Matthew 27 and 5 written down here. Let me flip over and read that one. And I'll, I won't have to shut up. Matthew 27 and 5. A man writing these kind of details about events that's going to happen some over 1,500 years later, and just 40 years prior to this, he was, walking, he was walking a flock of sheep out in the backside of a desert somewhere, and God come calling to him out of a bush. Yeah. Our God is amazing. Yes, he is. I don't know why I got Matthew 27 and 5. That's about Judas. Probably has something to do with them. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but God said it would be killed at evening. You realize that it came dark over the whole face of the earth? You know, there's an old story, and I'm, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to have to shut up here. We, we, we'll look at some more of these details on the Passover next week. You know, there's a, there's a story in history that, on the de that there was a time around the death of Christ that the whole earth become dark, and one of the Greek scholars, one of the Greek teachers, Philosophers was teaching that day in Greece, and when the, when when it became dark over the land, he looked at his class and said, "A god has died." That's right. There. I mean, it's recorded history, man. When Christ died, there rabbis who are now converted rabbis that believe on Christ. Well, I don't even know if they're rabbis anymore, but it's it's a it's a common thing that they say. That at the hour of day that Christ died was around the time that the, that the Passover was killed in the evening. And they say it's a very good possibility that the, the high priest, and I can't remember the, the actual Hebrew saying, it's something like tatatis day or something to that effect. But as they kill that Passover, they say in Hebrew it is finished. And around the time that they were killing that Passover over there on, on, in Jerusalem, and crying out, it is finished. The Lamb of God was crying out, it is finished on the cross of Calvary. And the moment he gave up the ghost, Gary, 
God's hand come down and rip the temple, the, rip the veil of the temple from top to bottom and let them peer into the holy of holies and signify to them that the way to me is now open through the blood of my son. Amen. I thank God for the cross of Christ. Amen. We'll look at some more of these things next week, some of the more details of the Passover. One of the things there I, I really want to look at is where he, he tells them how to eat it with, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and how, how we should, our communion with Christ, we should be keeping that communion with Christ, Paul said, with unleavened bread, casting out the old leaven. We, we should be living pure lives, casting out all the old leaven. And then he told them to eat it with bitter herbs. Not only should they be casting out the leaven now, but they, the bitter herbs was to remind them of their past in Egypt. That's the communion of the cross. Is we should be purging out that old leaven and remembering the shame and the bitterness of what it was to be in bondage to sin. Amen. We'll look at some of that stuff next week. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another day of life. We thank you for the many blessings. Father, we thank you. God, for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for the great sacrifice that he made for us on, on the cross. God, I just personally thank you, Lord, for loving an old wretched sinner like me enough to give the greatest thing that you had, Lord, as a sacrifice to bear my sins in his own body and to groan upon the tree dying for me. And God, I, I just thank you for that. I thank you for redemption. I thank you for forgiveness of sins. But most importantly, Father, I thank you for the, for the union and, and the and the great joy and, and blessing of being able to know you and to know your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God, I ask that you be with us now in the remainder of the service. Be with those, Father, that couldn't be here this morning. Comfort them, bless them, and strengthen them, Lord. And we ask it all in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh.